We're joined on the phone today by author Brian J. Jones and talking about his book, Jim Henson, The Biography. How are you today, Brian? I'm doing great. Can you hear me okay? I'm on a, I'm on a cell, so I always want to make sure. Yep, I can hear you okay. Everything sounds good, and I'm excited to talk to you about this book. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, uh, first, let's talk about the book uh, that you wrote about Jim Henson, the uh, biography. This is uh, looks like a definitive story on his life, for sure. Uh, well, it was definitely the first. Uh, I'm hoping it's it's definitive. I certainly talked to uh, plenty of people about it. Yeah, just looking at the book, it's uh, it, it's incredible the amount of research and the sources that you used. I mean, how were you even able to keep all this stuff straight? <laughs> Well, I'm I'm very analog. Uh, I'm I'm a black binder kind of guy. I I have all my notes printed out. All the my interviews I have transcribed and print those out. I put them all in binders. Uh, you know, I keep them all on the shelf. I categorize stuff chronologically. I, I categorize stuff by topic. I had a complete binder, of course, that said just Sesame Street on it, and another one that just said you know the Muppet movie on it. So uh, it's just one of those matters of uh, sort of knowing how to find it when you need it. Part of part of that I think came from the fact that I worked. Uh, in the United States Senate for about 10 years, and one of your skills you sort of have to come up with is an ability to compress and find a lot of information and sort of, com- you know, compress it down into a page or so so you can brief your member. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it actually sort of is a skill that translated to biography, although I didn't know that at the time. Yeah, I would say if the listeners out there are a fan of uh, Jim Henson or the Muppets, uh, this obviously the book you want to pick up. And I want to ask you, Brian, what is it about Jim Henson that made you want to tackle this project? Well, you know, I think p- part of it is is I always call myself sort of Muppet Generation 1.0 because I was the first generation raised entirely on Jim and the Muppets. Uh, you know, he'd been around a little bit in the 60s and so on doing, you know, Jimmy Dean and doing commercials, but I was two years old when Sesame Street came on the air. So, so I was sort of the first generation that had the Muppets right in their wheelhouse. Uh, you know, I was two when Sesame Street came on, and I was nine when The Muppet Show debuted, and I saw The Muppet Movie at the theater, and I saw Dark Crystal in the theater. You know, I remember all these sort of formative experiences sort of following Jim and growing up with Jim, and then sort of tragically having him taken away from me just as I was becoming a grown-up myself. Uh, you know, I think I, was, I think I was 20 when Jim died, or 19. So, uh, you know, it was a real, uh, it was a sort of a dream project in that regard, in that he was one of these people I had known about all my life or knew of. I didn't know a lot about his his um, his personal life because that's one of the things that had never really been covered before. A lot of the the really great books out there are all about his work. There's a terrific book called "Of Muppets and Men." There's another one called "Jim Henson," you know, the the works. So there's there's tons of great books about his work out there. But there really hadn't been one that got to look solely or or exclusively at him. Maybe I'm exclusively because Jim's always wrapped up in his work, but sort of put the focus on him. So it was a really it was a really great project to take on for somebody, especially of my age and my generation, who really did grow up with the Muppets, had them there the entire time, never had to wait for them to come along. Again, we're on the phone today with Brian J. Jones and talking about his book, Jim Henson, The Biography. And I think it's interesting when you look back at the early days of his career, you wouldn't think that uh, puppetry would kind of take over the world like it did for the Muppets, but... Uh, all the major networks said no to him at first, and, and obviously they're, it's kind of like with a guy that said no to the Beatles, maybe. Yeah, in a way. You know, I mean, it, it's really interesting because Jim's, Jim's, Jim's career it was on a very different trajectory uh, you know, for most of his, his early, you know, early years and throughout his 20s and on into his early 30s. If you watch him through the 60s, he's doing a lot of really interesting experimental work and, you know, one-hour um, sort of avant-garde Twilight Zone episodes and and uh, he does a short seven-minute film called uh, Time Piece. It's actually nominated for the Academy Award, and he talks about opening sort of an adult-themed nightclub where you would, you know, project movies that sort of throbbed in time to the music, and, and you know, a lot of things that the technology wasn't quite ready for, wasn't quite there to, to help him out. And Muppets were just one of the many things that he did. In fact, if you look at the commercials he was putting in the newspapers in New York at the time, the Muppets were actually the last thing on the list, or, the, you know, the puppets themselves. The, the company was called Muppets Incorporated, but the actual puppetry work was the last thing on the list that he was sort of trying to make sure people knew him for. But once he was convinced that the Muppets could hold their own on television, he had done a lot of appearances on things like Ed Sullivan and Jack Card and done these little five-minute sketches. But he knew that they would work in a half hour, and he just couldn't convince the right people. And uh, I, I, the reason I say it's a real study in intuitiveness is because he went through three different pilots uh, for the Muppet Show before 
finally somebody said yes. And, and he had great people he was pitching it to. You know, the, the first person at ABC who really expressed an interest in Jim and really wanted to give him a chance was Michael Eisner, who ultimately became president of Disney and is the one that was trying to help purchase the Muppets and when Jim died. So, you know, this was, this was a guy who clearly got it, um, but just couldn't quite, you know, grab a hold of it at the right time. The person who finally believed in Jim was Lord Lou Grade uh, from ATV over in London, who said, you know, I love the Muppets, I love what you're doing, I will stay out of your way, I will give you a, a lot of money to put the Muppets on the air, and $125,000 an episode, which is a phenomenal amount of money in, in for half an hour in 1976, uh, really believed in Jim, really got Jim. They were sort of cut from the same cloth. And, and it's the one that gave the Muppets a chance. And so from there, once that happened, CBS picked them up, put them into syndication. It was really sort of the first U.S. syndicated success story. So when he was able to finally uh, see that success, was it important to him to kind of keep the Muppets uh, as something that appealed to kids, obviously, but uh, also adults? It, it kind of uh, it's kind of the best of both there. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's sort of one of the great, I don't want to call it fallacies necessarily about the Muppets, but, you know, when they when ABC first relaunched the Muppets on television earlier this year or late last year, there was a lot of hand-wringing going on about what would Jim think, and these are Muppets that are, you know, sort of telling adult jokes and are appealing to, to grown-ups and what happened to kids. Jim's always been sort of a cross-generational per, uh, performer, uh, you know, really saw the Muppets as family entertainment, not just for kids. He was really sort of frustrated when Sesame Street came along, for example, because he got pigeonholed. They got pigeonholed not just as a puppeteer, because he saw himself as doing a lot of different things than just puppetry, but a kid's performer. And so he was really trying to break out of that mold. And that's one of the things that the Muppets and the Muppet Show kind of did for him. There's a lot of there's a lot going on in your regu- you know, in your average front of the mill episode of the Muppet Show. There's a lot of stuff that plays right at little kids, a lot of teen and a lot that goes right over their heads and plays to the adults. So Jim's one of these guys again who sort of crosses generations and even cross cultures. The Muppets was huge overseas. It was, you know, shown behind the Iron Curtain. I mean, they dubbed it into German. They dubbed it in all these different languages. Jim, Jim really had that sort of cross-cultural, cross-generational appeal. Uh, and that was really where he wanted to be. He didn't want to be a kid's performer. He wanted to be a family and even sort of a, a grown-up entertainer. Yeah, it is amazing. As you mentioned earlier, you think of Sesame Street, and of course you had the movies, and you had the cartoons, and um, you know even some hits on the Billboard charts, I think. It really kind of took over every facet of pop culture. Yeah, you know, Muppets, were, they were sort of everywhere. And what's, what's so interesting about Jim is he's got, he, he, he fought for almost 15 years to get a Muppet show on television. Once it gets on TV, he's ready to go on and do something else. He really wanted to go into the movies and do the Muppets uh, in the movies, of course, but he really wanted to move on to something that looked completely different, The Dark Crystal, a hugely important project to him, really his kind of artistic sensibility. Um, you know, he, he wanted to do that even before he did the Muppet movie, and, and uh, you know, ATV said, let's, let's take care of the Muppets, first and then yes you can do this one next but i mean jim once he's got the muppets right where he wants he's kind of ready to move on he always had this ability to sort of stop and walk away and go on to the next thing you know he he sort of did it with the muppet show it's five years on the air biggest show in the world huge audience and jim says that's a very nice show nice is always a big jim henson word very nice show and takes it off the air to go do other things he does the same thing with fraggle rock on five years it's hbo's first original series if you don't have Fraggle Rock, you don't have Game of Thrones, <laughs> you don't have The Sopranos. Uh, after five years, Jim says, that's a really nice show. Takes it off the air to go off and do other things. So, so Jim was not one of these people who was, who was you know, who found puppetry, you know, uh, precious, things like that. He was like, this is great. This is a great form of entertainment. I want to move on and keep pushing the boundary and doing other things. Uh, and I told Lisa Henson at one point, I was part of his problem because I was 13 uh, when the Dark Crystal came out, and I walked out of there saying, where were the Muppets? Where were the Muppets? And the poor guy was trying to break away from that the entire time, and people like me at age 13 were trying to drag him, kicking and screaming, back into being the, the Muppet performer. So with that being said, I know uh, Jim Henson died uh, rather young, but had he lived, do you think uh, maybe the Muppets would have been uh, on the shelf and something drastically different would be in its place now, or where do you think it would be? You know, it, it's tough to say with Jim because one of one of the things he was doing when he was when he was trying to sell the company to Disney is again it gets to his remarkable ability, ability to walk away. There are many people who thought that one of his intentions was to sort of I don't want to say park them, but hand the Muppets over almost entirely to Disney. Now he really wanted to be involved in training the puppeteers and things like that. He 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 got very frustrated with with some of the Disney executives who thought 
they, that puppetry was a toy box. All you needed was the puppets. Jim was trying to make them understand you needed performers like Frank Oz and Dave Bowles and Jerry Nelson to do this. But a lot of people thought he was going to be content to sort of hand that side of the company off to Disney and go off and do his own thing. It was very important to him in that negotiation, for example, that he have his own independent production company. So he wanted to go off and make, make different kinds of movies now, you know, explore the kind of stuff he'd done in Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and try to take that to the next level. Uh, he was a real gadget junkie. He loved technology and, and really sort of, there's a video you can find online on YouTube where he's essentially predicting the rise of YouTube um, and handheld cameras and understood that cable was the future and that you could do great things on cable you couldn't do on regular TV and you should go to high def. You know, this guy who really loved the technology. And I think what's really uh, sad is it would be really fun to know what Jim would have done with CGI and 3D and a lot of the technology that, you know, we look at it sort of almost gimmicky. Um, I think he would have found something really new and different to do with that that we haven't even thought of. Yeah, absolutely. Again, we're on the phone today with author Brian J. Jones talking about his book, Jim Henson, The Biography. And you mentioned a CGI, and I wanted to get your sense as to, I guess, the art of puppetry today and, you know, some of the techniques that Henson kind of pioneered. Do you think they're maybe in danger now thanks to CGI and some of the uh, computer techniques that we use now? Well, no, because I think what people have started to discover, and you, you saw it, in fact, in, you know, the new Star Wars movie, is when people first got a hold of CGI, they really loved taking it and running with it and playing with it. And, you know, like George Lucas said, let's do an entire movie with it. I'm not just going to build sets if I can. Let's do the entire thing in the computer. And that sort of ran its course. And then J.J. Abrams came in and said, you know, I'm going to start building things again. And I'm going to actually have, you know, sets that look like spaceships. And we're going to film outside. And so I think it sort of ran its course. And so I think you're seeing a lot of people going back and realizing that part of the wonder and part of the fun of films is having things that are built having things that exist. Uh, you know, that was one of the wonderful things about Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal has its flaws, but one of the great things about it is everything you see on screen there really does exist uh, and finished to almost a fault. They, you know, people said that you would walk onto a set and Jim had finished it all the way behind, you know, behind it where you were never going to have a camera see it, but he would finish the entire set out. So I, so I think, you know, I think now that CGI is sort of, just become more of a tool than quite such a gimmick that people will start moving back into puppetry and doing, you know, the kind of animatronics that are fun. And, and, you know, they'll they'll still go to CGI to keep costs down and things like that. But I think people really have come to appreciate that there's nothing quite like a human being operating something like that, that the, that the impulse and the, and the technique and the sort of spontaneity, you really can't quite get that with CGI. It really takes a human being to do that. Absolutely. And of course, I got to ask you, Brian, if you could point to a favorite Muppet out of all the uh, different universes out there, would you be able to point one? Uh, I'm still, uh, I'm a Sesame Street kid. It's, it's a tough call for me, but because I like, I love so many of them. I love Rolf the dog, but, um, but I'm a Sesame Street kid. So Ernie and Bert, uh, which I have to sort of do is all one word. Uh, Ernie and Bert are always still sort of my, my favorites. If I have to pick one, I think the one I really came to appreciate as I was writing the book and finally was moved this up and was is Walt the dog, who I who I think really reflects Jim's personality the closest, even more so than Kermit. And if you go go online and go to YouTube and look at old Jimmy Dean show clips if you can find them and just watch him performing with that character, it is nothing short of wonderful. Absolutely convincing, very, very funny, and Jimmy Dean believes in it entirely. It's a really, really wonderful character and one that I really came to love. Awesome. And I know that you're working on some stuff now. I heard uh, a book about George Lucas might be in the works. Uh, if, if I can stay on target here, you should have it by December 16th of this year. The, uh, the draft is done, <laughs> and uh, we're in edits right now, and I'm trying to run down my photos and do all the sort of behind-the-scenes things. But, uh, but it is done and on the move. So, yeah, you should have it by Christmas this year. Excellent. And real quick, I know the book is available at bookstores and Amazon. Is there maybe a website you would direct the listeners to? Uh, my own personal website is brianjjones.com, but that's going to direct you out to Amazon and, and uh, Barnes and & Noble and your own favorite local bookstore. Everywhere should have them as well. Excellent. Well, again, the book looks great, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time out with us today, Brian. No, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. And again, that was author Brian J. Jones and his book, Jim Henson, The Biography, available now.